Hi, I'm Jill Bright, Executive Director of Tawny. Today, I'm in my office at the Tawny Center in downtown Canton, New York. I'm going to be speaking with Michaeli Glennon. Hi, Michaeli, who is Science Director at the Adirondack Watershed Institute at Paul Smith College. Michaeli has spearheaded and leads a community-based art meets science project called Wool and Water. Last year, Michele curated a traveling exhibit about the project that made a stop at the Tawny Center. And if you visit Tawny's YouTube channel, you'll find a video of a program we, we recorded with Michele at the time called About Wool and Water, a virtual event. Since that time, the project has continued to evolve and an updated version of the exhibit, Wool and Water Resurfaced, featuring new pieces made for the project, recently opened at the Tawny Center. So today we're going to talk about what wool and water is, what developments have taken place since we last spoke in early 2021, and we'll show you examples of pieces in this year's exhibit. You'll also find out how you can get involved in the project. So Michaela, before we actually talk about wool and water, could you talk a little bit about what you do in your work as a science director? Sure. So I'm the science director for the Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute, and we are a program of Paul Smith College, which is the only four-year uh, college institution in the Adirondack Park, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we're a bit east of you, sort of in the middle of nowhere in a beautiful campus uh, centered on Lower St. Regis Lake. And we're a program of the college that is focused really on protecting water quality and protecting healthy watersheds. And so some of our flagship work here at AWI includes long-term water quality monitoring. And a very large portion of our work also involves the, our spread prevention program, which is aimed at preventing the spread and invasion of aquatic invasive species, which, which wreak havoc in our waterways. So lots of folks are often familiar with AWI through our presence at many, many boat launches in the northern part of New York State. You see our folks with the blue vests on and we are the ones that may come and talk to you as you launch your boat at, at one of the waterways in the northern part of the state where we are working. I am actually a terrestrial wildlife ecologist <laughs> by training and I've been at AWI for a couple of years now, about three years. And so I brought some work with me to AWI that's, that's a little bit more terrestrial and I am sort of the person that's focused more on the watershed part of the Watershed Institute, um, but I do a variety of different uh, projects. I do a lot of ecological research ranging from looking at things like our aquatic invasive species and what are the drivers of, of patterns of their occurrence and spread within our lakes um, to more wildlife oriented projects having to do with long term uh, changes in boreal bird populations that are resulting from climate change and other stressors. Um, I have a variety of other projects that look at, at different impacts to wildlife in the Adirondack landscape, in, including things like upland development, um, recreation. So, so most of my work sort of starts up, up in the terrestrial environment and, and eventually reaches the water. And my job here is really to, to do that research, but also to try to help us support our program through obtaining grants and support for the work that we do and to get it out there into, the, into a variety of audiences, including the scientific community through public presentations, uh, scientific presentations, conferences, publications, all that sort of thing. So I am, I am a, a scientist here at AWI. Wonderful. Lots of good things going on in that institute there and the work you're doing. So tell us about Wool and Water. What is it and how did it come about? So Wool and Water is a data art project. I forget the phrase that you used, but I love the way that you described it. Um, I, I've been calling it a data art project and it arose sort of as a, you know, a conversation that we were having a couple of years ago when we were proposing a grant um, and we were looking for some support, which we, we ended up securing from the Champlain Valley Natural Heritage Partnership, which is the um, National Park Service and the Lake Champlain Basin Program together administer the CBNHP, which is all about promoting the natural and cultural heritage of the Champlain Basin. So we were looking for some support to do a variety of educational programs around celebrating this year's 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And this was an idea that we kind of discussed in a small group saying, wouldn't it be kind of neat to, <laughs> to take an obsession of mine, which is knitting and crochet, and see if we could use art as a way to, to sort of do one form of education and communication. So we, we secured that grant. And so this, the Wool and Water originally was just a small piece of, of that grant, um, but it enabled us to, to get this project off the ground and to sort of test the idea of whether or not we could 
who could use fiber art in a, in a collaborative and participatory way to communicate and educate folks. So what we're doing is, is representing water quality information and concepts and trends um, through knitting and crochet and a variety of other fiber arts. And initially the collection was just things that I made, um, which is most of, of what was at Tawny the first time that we were there last year. Um, but we have very much wanted since the beginning of this to have it be a, a participatory thing. And so since that time, we've, we've also been wrangling other folks to create, create a variety of different pieces uh, and to grow the exhibit. And so, so that is where Woolen Water came from. Since that time, we've been able to secure some additional support for the project, sort of um, are in the process now of trying to make the exhibit a little bit more professional and keep it traveling around and get more people involved. So it's been, it's been very, very well received and a tremendous amount of fun for me. <laughs> well, and every time the exhibit goes somewhere, you pick up some new enthusiasts yes. who want to join in, right? So yeah. keeping it on tour is an effective way to keep bringing people in. And you, you actually have some ways that the group can communicate with each other, don't you? You have a Facebook page and other things that maybe you'll show we us We have a Facebook group, um, which is through our Adirondack Watershed Institute Facebook group. There's a, a subgroup, I guess you might call it, called Wool and Water, which is open to anybody. Um, there is also a Ravelry group for fiber um, geeks that are on Ravelry. They'll know what that means. <laughs> There is a Ravelry discussion group as well. There's also anybody that contacts me. Um, I can show you um, how folks can contact me through our website perhaps later on. But um, anybody that contacts me directly, I, I tend to add to uh, an email list of folks that I communicate with that way as well, just to provide them with updates of upcoming events. And when I'm particularly seeking people to make a certain type of thing, <laughs> that sort of communication. So there's a variety of ways to, uh, to, to get involved. And have, have there been any particular moments in the last year plus since we last spoke to you that have made you feel really good about how the project is growing, expanding, and reaching more people? Any milestones along the way that you'd want to share with us? Well, I, 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 I can't neglect to mention that just securing additional uh, grant support for it has been great. The first, the first grant, it was a small piece of a relatively small grant. We have since received um, a larger grant just for Woolen Water alone from the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And that will really enable us to sort of, as, as mentioned, sort of do a little bit more professionalizing of the exhibit and try to, to shop it around to a bigger geography, just enable me to try to, to spend more time um, making a more professional exhibit that can, can reach a wider audience. Um, I'd also like to do some updating of the information and tools that are available on the website that will help people get involved, do some shorter videos and, and things like that. Um, we also received a small grant from the Northern York Audubon um, chapter up here, which was I, which I pitched to them as let's let's do a bird focused version of Bull and Water, <laughs> and so that similarly will help me to get people uh, interested in birds, and particularly birds that are connected to water and to highlight birds, which is a is a huge focus of research that I do here in the Adirondacks. So, so those are two two um, examples of ways that that make me feel really good about where the project is going. Um, just in general, I would I don't know if I could even pick a favorite, but when we go and and sort of out in the community and show the exhibit. We were at the farmer's market, we know, we've been a couple of other places um, and I see people's reactions to it. It's just, it's just tremendously um, exciting and interesting to see sometimes reaching an, a different audience who otherwise you know, might not stop to talk at a, a table talking about aquatic invasive species, but maybe if they saw something knitted that might get them to come over. So that's been, it's been really fun and interesting. Well, I bet at this point, anybody who's watching this is dying to know exactly what these pieces look like. So let me let me pull this up on the screen here right now. Um, this is just uh, giving you kind of an overview of the current version of the exhibit, which, as we said, is called Woolen Water Resurfaced. And it did open at the Tawny Center on July 9th. It will be closing on July 30th and then moving on to its next stop. Um, this is just to give a sort of an overview of some of the pieces that are in the exhibit and what it looks like in the upper level gallery at the Tawny Center right now. So yes, these are all new pieces uh, that have been made since last year. Um, let's talk about some of those in detail. This is one that you made, Michele. Tell us about this one. Sure. Um, I'll, I will start by saying that I am, I am a person who is so attached to the change of seasons <laughs> that I made this last winter and during the winter all I'm thinking about is snow and ice 
<laughs> everything I made last winter was around snow and ice and those sorts of things. And then um, I think we're going to talk about a couple of other pieces that I've made since then in the warm season when I'm thinking about invasive species. <laughs> the things that we think about in the warmer time. So this is um, reminding me of last winter. And what this is, is a representation. Uh, I, I really want to do a piece about ice fishing. I am not an ice fisherman, but it is one of the things that I appreciate so much about living here. I always say I never want to live in a place that doesn't have ice fishing and doesn't have float planes. And I guess that means I'm really connected to the lakes. I just love to see um, people ice fishing. And I love the whole notion of ice fishing being a part of our, our culture. Um, and so I was looking for a way to represent that. And I came across a paper um, by Leslie Knoll and her colleagues. She is at the Itasca Biological Station in Minnesota. And they did a research, they did a project uh, and published a paper on sort of the impacts of climate change on cultural things like ice fishing and um, ice festivals and ice skating and, and those sorts of occurrences. And what she found, what they found was that during winters in central Minnesota, in this case, when the mean winter temperature is above about 25 degrees, ice fishing derbies tend to get canceled. It just mm -hmm. becomes sort of, a, the, the ice is a risky <laughs> environment under those, under those conditions. And so what I did with this piece was to, to, just to take that threshold and apply it to our system here in Northern New York. I couldn't find any actual data of when derbies had been canceled, although it certainly does happen here on Lake George, for example, we've seen this in more, more recently, um, but I just applied that same threshold. So this whole piece um, is a scarf. It's actually a, it's a free pattern called the Swiss cheese scarf. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> so I just made it first with uh, the number of holes, each hole representing a uh, winter um, starting and I think it was 1899 uh, or something as far back as I could. Yeah, 1899. Um, so each of those holes is a winter. I, I think of it um, hanging vertically. So if you read it sort of like a book. So in this case, you know, starting at the bottom left and reading up, but each hole um, would be one of those winters. And then after I made it, I, I then felted it to sort of give it a more robust texture. And then I embroidered the blue, which is just with the embroidery thread, um, around winters that are ones in which the mean winter temperature, December, January, February, was above that threshold, was 25 or higher. So those are winters in which, you know, we might have had ice fishing events canceled as a result of a warming climate. And if you sort of look at the whole thing, you can see that the frequency of that occurrence is, is happening more often, you know, now in recent times than in the, in the distant past. So Right, because the photo, the photo that we're showing, uh, the second photo here, where you're seeing a lot of the blue, that's the right side of that scarf. If you're kind of looking left to right in terms of how it was displayed here, you you see lots of white on that left side, and then as you progress along, you start to see more and more blue as you get over to the right side. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's uh, worth noting at this point that many of the pieces that are made for this project are wearable. And that's one of the things I like about it a lot, that it, they look really interesting and attractive and people will comment on them. And then that gives you an opportunity to talk about what they represent. So I have not worn this one anywhere, but I, I would love to. And that is, I feel similarly, <laughs> the ones I can wear are the most fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on to the next one here. Uh, this one's called Osita Birds, and it was actually made by your mother. It right? was made by my mother. Yeah. <laughs> my so mom is a great is this? tester for me in this project. <laughs> so this one was in response in part to, as mentioned, the Northern New York Audubon grant. I've been asking people just kind of casually, you know, do you want to make a piece about birds um, because of that grant? And so this was sort of a natural um, idea for her and I, my mom lives um, on Osita Lake in the Adirondacks, which has a spectacular, I mean, it has a lot of marsh habitat, but the one that's right next to, <laughs> to where she is, is just a, a spectacular marsh that I wander over to all the time. It's right around the corner from where I live. And it is, it is such a sort of good bird habitat that it's actually in, if you go into eBird on their website, it's, it's a birding hotspot a place where you know people go often enough and submit records of what they have seen in that spot that it becomes a hot spot on eBird. So what she did for this, just as a way of representing birds occurrence um, and highlighting birds, in this case, birds that occur in, in this marsh, um, was to take 
Stephen West's boneyard shawl pattern, which is a pretty simple kind of straightforward, you know, stockinette with the garter ridges in between. Um, she just made that pattern and she made it so that there were 12 sections of that stockinette kind of plain knitting sections, which we thought of as the 12 months of the year. And then I went on eBird and extracted just simply the number of, of bird species that were reported in each month of the year in her marsh. And so you see some of them have no data because there's very few people going out to Osita in February or January, making observations and putting them on eBird. But if you look at the middle months, um, sort of April through August, um, there's lots and lots of birds. So each pink bead just represents a bird species. And you can just sort of see that the, there are a few months there where there's you know, lots and lots of birds. And she just put them in there randomly anywhere she wanted to. Mm -hmm. So that's a relatively simple approach um, to representing data, but it was it was kind of a, a quick and easy data set to go. <laughs> Anybody can go on eBird and sort of grab that kind of data if you live in a place that has has good bird data, good bird observations. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I love it that there is the opportunity to participate at, at all different levels of skill. You don't necessarily have to be advanced fiber artist to be able to participate. Absolutely. Now, this is another one you made, and I find this is one I'd wear <laughs> for sure. I find this very attractive, but it, what does it mean? So this one, um, in contrast to the ice fishing one, which I made in the middle of winter, this one I made most of the pieces of while I was sitting on the beach in Sanibel during spring break <laughs> because it was warm and I was thinking about warm water issues. So this one is a representation of a shifting community of, of plankton uh, in Lake Champlain. And this is based on the work on, on work of Tim Myhook and his students um, at SUNY Plattsburgh who have been looking at sort of plankton communities in the lake for a long time. Um, Bachwald et al. is the actual paper that I, that I focused this work on. But what it was is what they found really was that increasing prevalence of cyanobacteria, so blue-green algae in Lake Champlain over time is associated with a decline in both the abundance and the diversity of zooplankton. And so I just wanted to illustrate that community shift, in this case using crochet. Um, I love crochet because of the freedom to just create anything, <laughs> anything you want to. So in this piece, the multicolored yarn is meant to represent zooplankton of any variety. <laughs> um, I couldn't tell you what species because I'm not a person that studies those, but I did try to look at some photographs and mimic a few species. Um, the bluish green yarn, that's kind of a solid color, is meant to represent uh, blue-green algae. Again, a variety of different types, but you can see if you look from sort of in, in the left-hand portion of the slide here, if you look from, in this case, top to bottom, the blue-green solid colored yarn becomes more prevalent as you get toward the bottom of the piece. And that's meant to show, you know, as we are seeing more of the cyanobacteria, more of the blue-green algae um, increasing in the lake, it's resulting in the decreased abund abundance and, and diversity of the zooplankton of the other colored yarn. And, and, so, and what implications does that have? What, what does that change about who lives in the lake or what lives in the lake? Well, yeah, so, so the zooplankton, you know, are the, are the base of the food chain. So certainly things that are affecting the base of the food chain is likely to sort of propagate those impacts throughout. Um, the cyanobacteria are increasing from things like nutrient pollution, including phosphorus and other, other issues that um, result in, in increasing prevalence of those species. And then often um, can result and lead toward harmful algal blooms, which is something that most folks I think have heard about at this point where, you know, algal blooms are, are a naturally occurring phenomenon, but we seem to have, you know, increasing uh, prevalence of them now, partially maybe from warming climate, but also from some of these nutrient dynamic issues in, in a variety of different lakes. And some of them um, are the result of toxic bacteria sort of growing out of control. And then they can create real problems um, where we read newspaper articles about, you know, dogs getting in there and, and ingesting them and, and being poisoned and things. So th those really are, um, sort of a aesthetic and biologically problematic uh, issue, but I'm, I'm sure that the, the impacts of the zooplankton communities themselves are also potentially propagating up through everything that feeds on the zooplankton and then the larger uh, organisms throughout the food chain. Yeah, and you know, for swimmers too, if you're swimming in these bodies of waters and humans can ingest these toxins as well, that's a, that's a problem. Now here's a miniature <laughs> presentation of the data. 
This is wonderful. So tell us about chickadee. Yes. So this is an example of non um, wool. One of the questions I always get is, what, 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 I don't know how to knit or crochet. Could I still make something? And I would say, that's just the name of the project, but I welcome anything, anything you want to do in this general realm of sort of art, art and science and the, and the idea of, of water quality. And so this is, is Jennifer Lieb, who has, she is on Instagram under Stars Above Studio. If anyone is on Instagram, she posts amazing stuff all the time on there and she does beadwork and also the, um, you know, the metal work at the top of these earrings. And so she was interested, she had already done some earrings in the past um, with birds and she was interested in making a piece. Um, and so she and I spoke and I ended up giving her some information from um, long-term data that I have from surveying of boreal bird species in the Adirondacks. So the chickadee in this case is the boreal chickadee. Um, and those are data that come from my long-term survey of boreal birds in the Adirondack Park. These are species which are truly sort of northern. They're on their southern range extent in the Adirondacks. And unfortunately, some of them seem to be retreating as a result of a change in climate. Boreal chickadee is one of the examples of the birds that I track. So I took, I think, what, 38 <laughs> um, of our wetlands. We sample about 60. Um, I picked some that we had the best data for just to sort of equate to the length of an earring. We didn't want to have earrings that were this long. <laughs> so 38 sites and each sort of uh, string represents a year starting in 2007 and going through 2015. Um, so a decade's worth of data or 2006 to 2015. Um, and each year you'll see either one of three colors, dark blue, which means we didn't find the bird, light blue, which means we found the bird, and then the orangey one is, we didn't get there that year because we didn't have enough money <laughs> to do the mm -hmm. surveys. And I wasn't sure, we, we went back and forth over whether we should include that or not, but it is true. We are impacted by whether or not we have the resources to do the work in any given year. So, but you can see that, you know, over time, as you sort of look from left to right, the, the occurrence of those lighter blue beads is, has, has been getting less for this particular species in the sites where I'm looking for them. They are also occur on, in high elevation. It's possible that they are using more um, high elevation habitats and they're just dropping out of my low boreal peatlands where I've been looking for them, but we can see sort of a, this is an example of several birds that I've seen a decline in, uh, in these boreal wetlands, um, peatland habitats in the Adirondack Park uh, since about the early part of the 2000s when I started that work. And so, so uh, on, yeah, yeah. Based on looking at this then, uh, the last two years of that survey, 2015, 2016, they were only seen in one of the 38 locations. Yes, um, I should say that we just wrapped up um, just about last week, the 15th year. And so we, we have sort of been going in these five-year increments of analysis for that work. We, we did a five-year analysis and a 10-year, and this was the decade sort of worth of data. This winter, I will do an analysis of, of 15 year data set. So I haven't dug into the time since 2015 much to tell you what, you know, whether that trend has continued, um, but that I'll be able to, you know, come back, <laughs> make some, get Jen to make some 15 year earrings maybe um, yeah, exactly. to confirm yeah. or maybe change what the trend is. Um, so this, this was that snippet of time that the data were already sort of put together for, but we'll be yeah. able to say more. Um, in a couple of months. Wonderful. Okay, interesting. Okay, now this is moving away from crochet and knitting into a different kind of textile art. Yes, this this again is um, not anything that I know how to do, but I appreciate so much that people are bringing other types of fiber art into this project. This is Hallie Bond, and she makes these incredibly beautiful I'm not, I'm wall hanging, I guess. I'm not even sure what she calls them, but um, where she actually trans, um, I, don't, I don't even, I don't know the right terminology, but sort of transfers the actual pigment from a plant like the water lilies here, right onto the fabric by pounding it. And so she, I had seen some of her pieces like this um, in other instances, and she was interested in making a piece. She's also a knitter and, and did the tempestries that are in the exhibit right now. Um, but for this piece, she wanted to incorporate milfoil sort of into the style of work that she was already, already doing. And she's got several pieces that have these water lilies that I think are just gorgeous. Um, and so what this piece is meant to illustrate is, is just that milfoil, which is one of our most prevalent 
um, aquatic invasive species in the Adirondacks, uh, Eurasian water milfoil and variable leaf milfoil are the, are the two types that we have here. Um, it is a plant that can impact native species like this white water lily. Um, it gets into our waterways, it can spread really quickly, it's highly adaptable to a variety of different lake conditions, depths and temperatures and all sorts of things. And it tends to create these really, really dense mats and can crowd out native species, native macrophytes like this and other species. And so she added the milfoil with embroidery into this piece um, to kind of illustrate the potential impact of, of this negative um, aquatic invasive species on a plant like water lily that we all, I think, just love <laughs> and recognize as part of our system. So yeah, the way she, the way she's positioned the embroidery, it's like it's creeping towards the water lilies. And you, yep. you have the sense like, uh oh, next year it's going to overtake them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So there are lots of different ways to express the the data and what's occurring, you know, and this is where the people who participate in this project get to be really creative of, in terms of thinking about, hmm, which set of data do I want to work with? And how do I want to tell the story? And I, that's something I find really interesting about this. Yeah, it's great. That's really nice. I think this might be the last one that we were going to talk about today. Um, again, this is not you. This is These are two other uh, participants in your project who made this one. Yes, so this was made by Donna Fulkerson and Cindy Behrman um, helped her with it. Uh, Donna is someone who uh, has been to a couple of the workshops and she has talked with me a lot and I really appreciate her input. And one of the things that she has said a few times um, when in reacting to some of the pieces in the exhibit is, is just pointing out that their value as, as, you know, as art is one thing, but there's also value in sort of communicating science perhaps to someone for whom, um, you know, graphs and charts doesn't really work. <laughs> Right. So that she has said to me is part of what she appreciates about this. And so this piece, I think of it is, is so cool. And I think she was thinking to some degree about how would you communicate some of these, these concepts for kids, for example, in a piece like this. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, you know, straight, plain, um, knitted piece, pretty simple, but these pockets and you can dig into the pockets and find the boats and it's really neat. So, so what they're showing here is you know looking at boats as you might find them or encounter them that you know at our boat launches and then in some of those boats or associated with some of those boats you'd find the milfoil so that's the sort of um, novelty uh, fuzzy green yarn there and and so this was one that i think was a way to communicate the idea that a certain proportion of our lakes you know are gonna you're gonna find that milfoil when you look into the look into the boat look into the pocket and so, so i really i really like this one as sort of a a really it's the most interactive I think yeah. and I think yeah. it does I think it does lend itself way to well to perhaps communicating with with little kids who can take the boat out and look at it and look for the milk water. yeah and that fun of all right we have uh four options here and you know yeah. what what are the percentage chances we're going to find this or that in one of the other yes ones. she she found um I mentioned somewhere somewhere that you know, one in four surveyed lakes has milk oil in it. Um, I think that's on the Adirondack Park and Business Plant website. I, um, the, it's certainly the milk oil species um, by, you know, far and away are the two aquatic invasive species that we have most prevalent in Adirondack waterways. That would that'd be a representation of out of the waterways that we've surveyed. You know, there's thousands and thousands of lakes and ponds in the Adirondacks, not all of them have been surveyed, but of the ones that have been surveyed, you know, one in four is a pretty high percentage as opposed to some of our other aquatic invasive species, which are highly problematic, but at this point, not in very many lakes, something like zebra mussels and, and Asian clams are sort of, you know, generally a Lake Champlain and Lake George type of problem, for example, but milfoil is one that you do see in a, a significant number of our lakes. So those are the ones we thought we'd talk about. Of course, there are some other um, pieces. Where, where else will the exhibit be going after it leaves Canton? Do you have a, a schedule for it to travel to other locations? Yes, I do. So um, the, after we leave Tawny, the, mo the, the immediate thing that's coming up is, is this, the second week of August, sort of plus a couple of days, the 5th to the 13th or so of August is, a, is the week that we have called Water Week. Um, we started that a couple of years ago at AWI, but we, it's by no means just AWI. It's sort of everyone that we can get to, to participate with us in the Adirondacks to celebrate water in a week in August. We have a ton of events and other folks have events all over the park. 
Um, and during Water Week, um, for me, in addition to all the other stuff going on, there are three different wool and water related um, activities. One is on August 6th, I will be at the Wild Center. I'll give a presentation there um, in association with a science and art or climate and art festival that they're doing. So we'll be there that day um, and we'll talk about the project. We'll bring some pieces and we'll bring the exhibit and it will be there for most of, of the week of Water Week, most of that second week of August. Um, on August 9th, I will give a presentation at the Whalensburg Grange, which will be great. Um, in the evening, I think it's at 7 p.m. And then on August 12th, which is the Friday of that week, I will give a presentation at the Hub in downtown Lake Placid. That is the Northwood School Innovation Hub. It's right in the middle of town. Um, and then the following day, I'll be back at the Hub. We'll have the exhibit there um, and I'll do a workshop for anybody that wants to come along and, and do that. And, and, and at, the, at the Wild Center and at the Hub, we'll have the chance to have sort of the exhibit or, or some portion of it. And I've, I've been you know, talking with project participants for anybody that would like to share a piece. Well, I'll bring as much as I can fit and as much as anyone would like to share both of those places at the Grange. We'll just have a few pieces with us. But um, those are the most immediate sort of upcoming. And these are all on our website. If you go to our water week schedule, you can find all of them. Um, after that, upcoming includes the art walk in downtown Saranac Lake on the 15th. Um, we'll do a workshop with ADK Art Rise, which is a little um, a place here in Saranac Lake that does, uh, they have all kinds of interactive workshops and things, classes that you can take there. Um, in September, we'll be at that Adirondack Harvest Festival. And then we're working on where we're <laughs> where we go after that. So, so there's a lot of activity, a lot of yeah. activity associated with this, which is water week will be a lot of a lot of <laughs> a lot of action. If you if you're interested in trying to come and join us anywhere, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, great. So how do people get involved, Michaeli? So I can show you uh, the easiest way to get involved if I share my screen, if I can do that. Yep, you, you have the ability to do that. Let me... So this is, if you can see that, I hope, um, our website, which is adkwatershed.org. And if you go onto our website under the community tab, you can see that the project has its own website here called Bull and Water. And so this is sort of the first place that I usually tell people to go is to check out the website. And if you go here, you can find a bunch of background information on what the project is, um, what are some of the issues that we have been uh, trying to highlight with this work. Um, but this middle section right here, this banner will give you sort of pictures and examples and short descriptions of what each of these pieces are um, that are in the exhibit right now. At the moment, these are just pieces that I have made. I have to reach out to folks that have also made other pieces and ask if they would like them <laughs> to be here on our website. But right now you can get to, to each of these. And if you click on each one of these, um, I'll do it in another tab. This will take you actually to my Ravelry page for that same project. So Ravelry, again, is probably best known to fiber enthusiasts, but I have all of these um, publicly available. So for each project, um, gives a description of what it is. It will tell you and link to the data that I used, if there are data associated with it, how I made it, all that kind of stuff. This is all on my wool and water project page on Ravelry, um, which includes all of these. So you can get to all of those through all of our website. If you really want to dig in and see some examples of some of the projects, what the data were, whether there was an underlying knitting pattern to follow, all of that will be linked from the Ravelry page. Wonderful. Which you can reach by clicking on these images. Um, if you go down further on this page, there are a couple of videos. There's the one that we did with you last year, and there's a, a, another video. I hope to update and add some shorter videos onto the website. Um, with the new funding that we got available. That's one of the things that we want to do. But down here is a couple of different options to, again, just get people started. So um, if you click the open form right here, you can fill this out. And it just asks you a couple of questions that will help me to sort of get people started with this project. I know I, one of the hardest things for me is to sort of realize that 
I want to give people as much creative freedom as possible, but there is a segment of people that just want, you know, give me the pattern, I'll go make it. Right. <laughs> so this helps me sort of narrow down a little bit. Well, um, one of the one of the questions on here that interests me is, do you like to use a lot of colors or do you prefer to keep it simple with just a few? Because that would help you determine which data set to match right. a person up with, right? right? So for example, the piece your mother made that we looked at the shawl, very simple, one yarn, one color yes. bead. Yes. And, and that was uh, appropriate for the data she was representing. But if somebody really liked to work with lots of variables, then you could tell a more complex story, right? Absolutely. It depends how many ends you're willing to weave in. That's part of it, <laughs> yeah. which I probably should have put as one of the questions. But um, anyway, you can fill this out and this just, sends an email to me and then I can sort of use that as a, as a way to start to talk with folks um, about the project and get them started on a project. Um, there is the link to our Facebook group if you want to join that. I post there every once in a while. I, what I really wanted to do with the Facebook group was to sort of get the project so that folks would communicate with one another as well as just with me. I, I email with back and forth with a lot of people, but I wanted people to be able to share together and see who else is in the group. So not everybody in that email group is on Facebook, but a number of them are. And hopefully over time, we'll have some more sharing of pictures and ideas through that group for people that do face Facebook, which I realize is not everybody. Um, and then this ideas folder will take you to um, a Dropbox folder in which you can find a whole bunch of other information, sort of from the here's how to get started um, here's some basics of how you might represent data. There's a folder that has that sort of stuff. There's a folder that has, um, you know, kind of patterns that I have created. <laughs> and then a folder that just has data sets that do whatever you want with them. <laughs> I haven't created a pattern yet, but feel free to explore them. So again, over time, I just sort of periodically put things in those folders and you can, you can go in there at any time and, and tool all around and grab whatever you'd like to, to play with just as a, a starting point. Um, but I, in general, the, the easiest thing is to, is to fill out this form um, or to just email me. I think my email is right here at the bottom of the, of the webpage and that can, uh, that can get me started with talking to anybody, but this, this folder and, and our Facebook group and the Ravelry group also are ways to, to sort of begin to engage. And a lot of this happens as background communication. I do my best to, to stay in touch with everybody, but, but, um, but there's, some, there's certainly some tools to get started. Wonderful, okay. So if you would stop sharing at this point, um, is there anything else you'd like people to know uh, before we say goodbye today? Um, I guess I would say um, just if folks are interested, then absolutely take a look at our website, both for the, the wool and water uh, project itself and also for the upcoming events because there are a lot of opportunities to to see the project if you if you would like to particularly during water week there's going to be lots of things going on and over time we'll add more events and I, I really would like to add some events that are um, focused on bringing together the people that have participated in it um, I, I will say you know there's no timeline for this my main goal is just for people to have fun <laughs> um, so don't ever feel like you have to make something for me. I, you know, it's it's for you as much as it is for me. And if you want to share it, then that's great. And I hope to get us all together at periodic points throughout the project. But um, but there's no rush, and there's I don't want it to feel like an assignment for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, it, and the last thing I'll say is just is my generic call for artists right now, which is that I'm I'm still searching for people that want to do bird projects. <laughs> but that's um, all all of it will will continue. Yeah, wonderful. And I, I love these kind of community-based participatory art projects that involve people working with different kinds of skills and at different skill levels, all contributing towards making some bigger impact mm -hmm. results. So that's wonderful. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today, Michaeli. Um, you. If you've watched this uh, conversation and you're interested in learning more about other things that Tawny does, you can go to our website, which is tawny, T-A-U-N-Y dot org. We also post frequently on Facebook and Instagram, and you can find us at the Tawny Center in those two locations. And we'll, we'll hope you'll join us for other activities. So I'll talk to you soon, Michaeli. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Jill. Tawny is a community project made possible by the participation of many. We look forward to having you join us. Thank you.